All right, CBS News correspondent Errol Barnett again is traveling with the president. Errol, good to see you. He joins us now from Somerset, New Jersey. A question for you. Kim Jong-un has vowed to complete uh, North Korea's nuclear program despite recent sanctions and despite President Trump's promise to unleash, quote, fire and fury like the world has never known. Should we expect the president to maintain that tone when he speaks to the U.N.? Well, DeMarco, this will be President Trump's first address to the U.N. General Assembly, and really no one knows what to expect. His tone will likely come down to who he feels his necessary audience will be that day. If he feels as if he needs to speak to his domestic base, well, then you can certainly expect more of the same fiery rhetoric and a defense of his America First uh, policies and agenda. But more likely, as he's at the U.N. General Assembly, really in front of world leaders, is he will see uh, the rest of the planet as his audience. And in that case, you'll likely hear more of a defense or the need for the U.S. to defend its allies like South Korea and Japan to North Korean aggression and uh, the need for allies like China to do their part in exerting influence over its neighbor. But as we've seen in the past, uh, the tone that the president takes at these very important moments and uh, diplomatic speeches really comes down to his mood. And uh, we have also seen in the past, Earl, that President Trump has been very critical of the U.N., but Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is calling for a global response to fight against North Korea. What does that say about the administration's approach? Well, it's an acknowledgement on the part of Secretary Tillerson that, of course, diplomacy is necessary and the U.S. needs other countries to cooperate in order for President Trump to achieve his America First goals, the things he promised his constituents that he would do. However, behind the scenes, DeMarco, what we've seen is that the White House has ordered the State Department to reduce its diplomatic footprint at the UNGA, which says a lot itself. There will be fewer U.S. U.S. representatives from the State Department this year in New York than last year. And Secretary Tillerson himself has said that he will be attending fewer meetings and he will have a diminished presence. Now, Tillerson says, hey, this is in order to cut costs. The White House wants the State Department to cut about 30 percent of its operating costs. But critics say this actually proves ignorance on the part of Secretary of State Tillerson that he thinks there will be a benefit to having a smaller U.S. footprint at these events. This is where speed diplomacy diplomacy is done and some deals can be made. And if the U.S. won't have its presence, other countries then will fill that vacuum. It is also important to point out that the United States is the U.N.'s single largest donor. But U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley said uh, the world would have to, quote, wait and see whether the president continues that commitment. What message does that send to other world leaders? Well, it's similar to what President Trump had said to European allies, and that is essentially that the U.S. will not continue to be a major contributor to these international bodies unless those agencies and bodies prove to be more effective. He described the U.N. as incompetent as a presidential candidate. Now, as, as president, he's taken a bit more of a diplomatic tone, uh, as uh, has um, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, in saying that, well, the U.N. holds great potential. It can do great things. And President Trump was certainly very excited uh, when the Security Council approved a new round of sanctions against North Korea uh, uh, after another one of its ballistic missile tests. Uh, and we've seen um, in the European example, uh, President Trump isn't above criticizing allies while they're standing right next to him, as he did in Brussels uh, with NATO, complaining about the lack of other countries funding uh, the alliance to the same extent that the U.S. does. So President Trump, uh, with this Tuesday speech, is expected to kind of, you know, be in character. The hope, though, from diplomats is that he will acknowledge the necessity of working with other countries rather than criticizing them on the public stage. All right, Errol, a final question for you before we uh, let you go. Another topic that President Trump is likely to discuss, the U.S. commitment to the Iran nuclear deal. He has called the agreement the worst deal ever in the past. Uh, do we have any indication about how he feels about it now? Well, what we know is that President Trump is eager to rip up the Iran nuclear deal. It's a vestige of the Obama administration. He says it is also one of the worst deals uh, that the U.S. government has entered into. But within the White House, there is disagreement on exactly what next step to take. One of the options is that President Trump uh, and the administration could find that Iran is violating the nuclear deal, and which would trigger its uh, dismantling next month. 
There are others in the White House, though, uh, secure, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, for example, who believe that the best thing to do is to keep the, the Iran nuclear deal, but perhaps make some kind of amendment which would encourage Iran to stop its destabilizing activities in the Middle East in places like Yemen, in Syria, and in Iraq. The first hint we will get of what President Trump expects to do will be his Tuesday's speech. So we'll all be watching that very closely to see what comes next. All right, Errol Barnett traveling with the president. Errol, thank you. You got it.